<laughs> now, for those of you University of Oregon alums and Oregon State alums who thought that this program today might be the way in which one of those universities could get Pokey Allen and perhaps a national football championship, uh, that is not part of the agenda. However, the discussion about public education, higher education in the Portland area, has become somewhat along the lines of what used to be known to me as Snell's theorem. It goes like this. Somewhere there is a meeting going on deciding your future. Only you weren't invited. Here in Portland, we are in the dominant economic and population center of the state of Oregon. And we're home to the largest group of potential students at our state's universities. Its major public university, Portland State, continues to be overshadowed by our downstate rivals at the University of Oregon and Oregon State. And although there are limited resources for higher education, the three state universities find themselves vigorously competing with other one another for the same funds and often for programs that du duplicate themselves from one institution to another. Governor Goldschmidt has inserted himself into this debate by appointing a commission on higher education in the Portland metropolitan area. That commission is charged with analyzing the global economic, social, and other forces shaping the metropolitan area and what those forces have in terms of imp implications for higher education in the Portland metropolitan area. They then are to make recommendations for future structure of higher education in our community. This commission has been at work since last June and is scheduled to re release a major concept paper for public discussion in early March. After input from the public, the commission plans to issue a final report by November 15th of this year. For many in the academic and business communities and among the public at large, the time is ripe for major changes in higher education in the Portland metropolitan area. In addition to what is going on here, a new Chancellor of Education, Tom Bartlett, has vowed to make tough financial and institutional decisions regarding higher education in Oregon. He has said the state cannot afford three major research universities. At the same time, he has also said he's committed to raising faculty salaries to ranges closer to that comparable in comparable state university systems elsewhere. Portland State is now involved in its own search for a new president to lead that institution into the next century. As bin business interests, particularly in the high technology area, are demanding better trained engineers, greater emphasis on post-secondary science and math education, and more continuing education opportunities for postgraduates in our community. Whether the future involves new programs, increased funding, or a larger Portland State University, or a more drastic restructuring that brings Oregon and Oregon State into the Portland area's major players, the Commission's report to the Governor this fall and, and the legislature in 1991 will most likely set the tone of the debate. Indeed, the Commission's request for input has already led to a controversial report from the Oregon Council of the American Electronics Association which regards, re recommends, along with a number of other less publicized proposals, the elimination of Portland State as a separate entity within the state system of higher education and the establishment in Portland of major Portland area technology center and 100 million in new funding over the next six years. It is uncertain, some say unlikely, that the AEA recommendations will find their way into the commission's final report. However, they have gener generated a healthy discussion of the role of the public and the public's higher education in meeting the need for an educated workforce in the coming decade. Our speakers today are both uniquely qualified to give their own perspectives on the future of higher education in the Portland metropolitan area. Speaking first will be Scott Gibson, who is President and Chief Operating Officer of Sequent Computer Systems, Inc., a leading developer and manufacturer of mid to high range parallel computers. Before co-founding Sequent, he was general manager of Intel's memory component operation, and he is a trustee of the Oregon Institute of Science and Technology, and appears today in his capacity as chairman of the Oregon Council of the American Electronics Association. He also chaired the strategic working group that produced the association's report to the commission. And our second speaker today, whose introduction just got out of order, will be Roger Edgington, 
and he will follow Mr. Gibson's remarks. Mr. Edgington became the interim president at Portland State University in January of 1989. He has a long history with Portland State beginning in 1983 when he took on the role as director of business affairs. He has also served as vice president for finance and administration and was executive vice president of the university prior to his taking on the interim presidency. His role and length of time with the university gives him an important perspective on its evolution in the state system of higher education and its delivery of services in the Portland metropolitan area. As I said, they will each give an eight to 10 minute opening remark. That will be followed by two minutes of closing remarks. That will be followed by the first question from each of them to the others. Will you help me welcome speaking first, Mr. Scott Gibson from Sequent Computer. Thank you, Bill. I'm pleased to be here. And I'm also pleased, suspecting that many of you are here because you felt that perhaps the media has done you a bit of a disservice and uh, sensationalized what otherwise we think is a thoughtful report uh, on what is needed for our crucial industry uh, in support of Oregon's future. First, let me start with some quotations from people from our industry. Again, not, not representing that we're the only industry important to Oregon, but I think recognizing the electronics industry to be one of the major uh, legs of a stool that Oregon stands on for prosperity. Quote, we liked a lot of what we saw in Oregon, but the reason we didn't locate our semi-tech facility there was because we couldn't find the front door of the state science and engineering center, end, qu end quote. Or, quote, None of the graduates we've hired at my small electronics company in the last three years have been Oregon grads. I've been disappointed in what I've seen, end quote. Quote, as a student trying to take courses, it's hard to get information on what's available. Then you find yourself scrambling to find classes all over, only to discover you simply can't get to them. Quote, in California, the universities are always reminding you of what is available, that there is more to learn. Here they don't do that, they do not lead. Quote, we import two out of three of our technical employees. These quotes and views were expressed to us by industry officials in other states, by academic leaders in Oregon, and by a representative cross-section of our industry's workforce that we, AEA, interviewed in a series of focus groups which we sponsored with funding from our mem uh, member companies. Frankly, we were troubled and a little bit surprised by what we heard. We found that while Oregon universities have definite pockets of quality, including some excellent programs at Portland State, our universities in general lack program strength in engineering, a clear sense of mission, and a critical mass of the right programs here in the Portland area, which is where so many of our 115 member companies are located. Uh, this was what was turning over in the minds of our executives in our industry as we prepared our report in recommendations to the Governor's Commission on higher education. This is obviously reinforced in our case with the massive competition that we see in our industry. Uh, as you probably read every day, the Japanese are uh, upon our doorstep uh, as they are upon the doorstep of most of the industrial uh, groups within the United States. And so we have a daily reminder to the importance of education to the future of high technology industry here in Oregon. The Oregon Council of the American Electronics Association is not a Johnny-come-lately nor an idle bystander in pressing for change in higher education. We've waited patiently for significant steps since a report was presented in 1962 to then Governor Mark Hatfield calling for a major science and engineering center in the Portland area. Those steps have been slow and usually grudging in coming. We have since dispatched our lobbyists to Salem since 1983 with a top priority of winning resources to enhance higher education. We have battled first and foremost for faculty salaries. In fact, just recently, a, in December, we were the ones who called the governor to replace the video poker monies that were earmarked for faculty salary increases. So we have a tremendous kinship 
to our brethren in Portland State and the other fine academic institutions in this state in winning faculty salary increases. We've also fought for centers of excellence and educational innovation, such as the Oregon Center for Advanced Technology Education, or OCATE. Beside our sweat, our companies have put their money behind their requests. Tektronix, for example, in the 1980s has donated over $17 million, excuse me. That's a first. It's a busy industry, let me tell you. <laughs> And I hope that wasn't a customer calling because I've disconnected it. <laughs> That's a first for me too. You know, I never thought anyone actually call me on this thing. That's, <laughs> it's very exciting. So anyway, as I was saying, uh, before someone decided to call, not knowing what they were interrupting, uh, Tektronix in the 1980s donated over $17 million dollars uh, in cash and equipment to bolster higher education in Oregon. And in, not, since 1983, my company, Sequent, has also donated over 1.5 million in equipment or discounts to the educational institutions in Oregon. The list goes on. We've compiled a list for our industry. That doesn't make us heroes, but perhaps it explains our eagerness to get on with the business of improving our universities and our frustration with the logjam of inaction we have encountered since 1962. We also face mounting competitive pressures as our industry globalizes. Our margin for error is decreasing daily. Our ability to wait until tomorrow is rapidly diminishing. More than ever before, our industry needs a dynamic system of higher education as our partner. The U.S. electronics and software industry is in a fight for its life every day. As such, we need a workforce from the factory floor to the research laboratory to the corporate headquarters with access to relevant, leading edge, convenient, continuing education. Our product life cycles have sh shrunk dramatically. It used to be we could build a product and it would last for six to eight years. Global competition now, most of our products have a life of one to one and a half years. You can imagine the kind of competitive pressures on our industry to stay ahead, to stay leading. Our industry also needs access to the brightest new ideas emerging from the research universities, ideas frequently stimulated by close associations with people in our companies. And we need to tap a continuous stream of bright new minds who join our companies and are able to make contributions that will help us grow and create more jobs in Oregon. The, the partnership we seek is more than one-sided. We don't seek nor want Oregon's universities to be trade schools for us or for anyone. We aren't in attempting to eliminate vital university functions which, which help us prepare a broad, uh, based and minded student. Things such as foreign languages and social services uh, and social sciences are a crucial part of a well-rounded student. It's in Oregon's best interest to upgrade our universities, especially in Portland, in order to attract our state's very best students who too often are leaving the state. An expanded, more convenient system of continuing education throughout the state and throughout the Portland metropolitan area will benefit much more than just the employees of our companies. There is an education and continuing education market out there ready to gobble up good courses in business, foreign languages, communication skills, marketing approaches, and many other subjects vital to success in today's competitive world. Remember, a lot of the people doing the gobbling of these courses are people who often do shop at convenience stores just because they're convenient. And education really can't be any different. It has to be convenient as one of its major attributes. Top-notch research conducted in our research universities will draw the top international talent here in Portland. And it's proving out that where research occurs, that's where product research first takes its roots as a new business. Our state could desperately use the diversification provided by technology spinoffs. One example, our company has used some of the research spinoff from the University of California at Berkeley. We started with two employees and we now employ 1,100 employees after just seven years. So what did the AEA Oregon report really call for? 
Well, it certainly didn't propose closing down a university campus in Portland as the news media would have you believe. That would be outrageous. Instead, we called for major enhancements of university resources in the Portland area. In fact, we called for an investment of at least $100 million in higher education quality over the next six years. And given the types of budget surpluses we have and are likely to have in the future, we think this is a reasonable investment in our future. We anticipate that a good portion of this money, but certainly not all, would go to bolster science and engineering and research, especially in the Portland area. We make no bones about that, nor do we feel we should. It's my view, as someone who started up a major company in this area, that we put our future in jeopardy as a growing center for electronics and software companies unless we establish a major science and engineering center in the Portland area that is close to the bulk of our companies. As the Semitech siting official said, we need a technology center in Oregon with a recognizable front door. Quality programs, of course, don't materialize out of thin air. They require frontline faculty, a good mixture of seasoned professionals, coupled with promising young, young comers. Roger and the balance of the state university leaders labor with faculty salary schedules in the bottom 20% of the national average compared to other public universities. So they're at a significant disadvantage in bringing excellence to Oregon and to the Portland area. AEA Oregon said we also must invest to get those salaries into the top third of peer institutions nationally. Not to pick on Mississippi, but for example, our universities here, all three of them, have state salaries below the, the Mississippi State University, just to calibrate you uh, in, in a national average. This need can't wait. With the demise of state-run video poker, we run the risk in Oregon of falling even further behind in what, what we pay our university faculty members. AEA Oregon a few weeks ago has urged Governor Goldschmidt, as I indicated, to replace the funds from video poker, and we are heartened that the governor is preparing to request and has recently requested replacement of those funds. Our report contains some specific recommendations about how to sharpen science and engineering, engineering education, including the establishment of four applied research centers. These centers would focus on advanced computing techniques, semiconductor materials and devices, software engineering, and manufacturing technology. These are four areas we believe Oricon can achieve excellence uh, as opposed to, to mediocrity. They are linked to the kinds of electronics industry and innovation already present in our state. These centers would become the backbone of the new science and engineering center we envision for the Portland area and they would serve to help students graduating from our universities to obtain a relevant education, thus enhancing their own value in the job market. To betrust these centers and to meet our goal of more relevant science and engineering education, our industry committed to provide 100 new work-study opportunities for Oregon students. Our report also called for a new way to fund off-campus continuing education to give university officials a positive incentive to pursue what shapes up as a gigantic new market for them. That's the market for continuing ed. To keep us all in the up with the uh, very fast pace of the technology movement. Increase funding to improve overall quality, higher faculty salaries, enhance science and engineering programs, establishment of a science and engineering center in the Portland area, and more appropriate funding for continuing education. That is the core of our industry's recommendations to the Governor's Commission on Higher Education. Frankly, that agenda hasn't changed much for 25 years. So the question arises, how do we get this accomplished? The executives from our industry who worked on our report concluded that basic structural change is necessary if we are to jar loose significant new funding. There are a number of options theoretically possible, but to us none much makes much sense unless it changes Oregon's political arithmetic surrounding higher education, the arithmetic that has stifled quality investments in the Portland area. 
We chose an option that we understood would be controversial. We chose it because we believe it offers the greatest chance of producing real change and result in major new higher ed investments in Portland in light of 25 years of failure to move forward. It is admittedly a judgment which acknowledges political forces exist in our state. While, produced, while we produced our report, we also recognized and hoped that it would be a catalyst to real discussion on how to affect change in our state. And I'm very pleased that it has more than generated a real discussion on how we should make change in our state. While we see virtue in our structural proposal, we are not adopting an it's our way or no way attitude. We sincerely invite others to lay alternative ideas on the table. And we are prepared to rally behind an idea that unlocks the door leading to quality, relevant, convenient university resources in Portland, including engineering. Much has been written about our report. Not all of it has been accurate. We have brought copies of the report here today and encourage you to read it for yourself. The most and perhaps only controversial recommendation is our proposal to switch from a three university system to a two university system. Under our plan, the University of Oregon would be charged with meeting the undergraduate and most graduate level needs of our state's principal urban population center. The University of Oregon at Portland would be University of Oregon's second campus, not its branch campus. Likewise, Oregon State University would assume control of a combined statewide engineering school and establish a campus in Washington County. As you know, OSU already manages a campus with a full-time facility at the Mar Marine Science Center in Newport. The resources now flowing to Portland State University would be retained in Portland. These resources would be combined with new resources from the $100 million quality pool we proposed. This larger set of resources in turn would be managed by University of Oregon and OSU to meet their urban missions. Those missions to provide high quality accessible undergraduate education, especially for place bound students and especially in areas of particular relevance to an urban center. To offer targeted top quality graduate education of critical importance to business and industries located in the metropolitan area and to forge positive links with basic education to stimulate, for example, greater interest in post-secondary education among minorities and assist in upgrading math and science instruction. Our plan is not meant, nor should it be seen, as a condemnation of Portland State University. PSU has done many good things despite frequently being at the short end of the financial stick in the state. Some have accused the electronics industry of giving up on PSU. That's not true. Our industry from the beginning has been committed to the principle of making the entire system of higher education work better. We are not boosters of individual institutions. Many companies have been and remain strong financial backers of Portland State University. We simply have concluded, as Chancellor Bartlett has and many others, that Oregon cannot afford three research universities. Yet Oregon absolutely must have top quality university resources at work in the Portland area for the benefit of you. The challenge is how to achieve that goal. We believe the time is right now to make a major step toward that goal. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, for those thoughtful remarks. Uh, if that phone call was for me, I hope you'll just take a message. <laughs> Our second speaker today I've already introduced, but I already made a mistake in his introduction. I shorted him seven years of time in grade at Portland State University. He began there in 1976, not in 1983. Will you help me welcome the interim president of Portland State University, Roger Edgington. Thank you for inviting me here today. My purpose is to discuss higher education in the Portland metropolitan area and Portland State University. We have provided you with a fact sheet which should acquaint you with the history of Portland State and its current status. 
I believe you will discover information in this document which is not generally known in this community. I returned from Europe three days after the recent American Electronics Association report was released to the media. My daughter, who is a senior at the University of Oregon, met us at the airport. Her first words were, Dad, they're going to dismantle Portland State. They're going to eliminate it. And my first thought was, dismantle it? They should reinforce it. But my response to her was, Lisa, what else is new? <laughs> I have been at Portland State University since 1976. And I am sure that many of you know that this is not the first time that Portland State has been threatened. And unfortunately, it will probably not be the last time. I know that there are many of our good friends who have a limited view of this institution and would like to see us as a city college or as a good liberal arts undergraduate institution. I am glad to say that the city club studies reinforce the need for a major comprehensive urban university in this metropolitan area rather than this narrow vision. I am hopeful that most of the metropolitan community would like to see us grow and get on with our destiny as a major public urban institution in this metropolitan area. It's a pity that the recent AEA report identified a different alternative for structure, considering all those other good recommendations in that report. The increased salary recommendation. This is a most critical need of higher education in this, st in this state today. We are constantly losing faculty at all our institutions to other states. We have extreme difficulty in attracting new quality faculty because we are not competitive. And I applaud this proposal, Scott. Another great idea, invest $100 million in the Portland area in the next several biennia. Great, but that might not even be enough money. It also recommends that we use continuing education to enhance and improve the workforce, an outstanding suggestion. PSU currently has the largest continuing education effort in this state, almost 24,000 students. In fact, our new dean, Dr. Sherwin Davidson, who was introduced today as a new city club member, is seeking to expand that effort. The report also says that we should improve science and engineering studies by establishing this research center. And who has the infrastructure to succeed in that effort? I believe it's Portland State. It would be a tragedy to cannibalize our major state institution in this area to benefit only one segment of our business community, high tech. At PSU, we provide quality undergraduate and graduate education in 50 programs, including electrical engineering and computer science. We must serve all the community. Our university provides an environment for our faculty to pursue the essentials of their profession, teaching, research, and public service. We all benefit from their presence and their efforts. And I recognize that the electronics industry is essential to this state's economic future. And all of higher education must re-examine our support of that business. The AEA report has sent us that message, and we must endeavor to do a better job than we have in the past. The Governor's Commission on Higher Education is reviewing many proposals and alternatives on this subject. On February 8th, community leaders Roger Yost, Matthew Prophet, Bruce Willison, and Fred Stickle will testi testify before the Commission in support of PSU's major role in higher education. The theme of that presentation will be that the best approach to the development of higher education in the Portland area is that of consolidation and coordination rather than fragmentation. A single autonomously directed institution 
with comprehensive responsibility and authority can best serve the metropolitan area that dominates state population and economic activity. Any cure to the malaise of higher education in the metropolitan community must have PSU in the prescription. This leads me to focus on PSU. You know, it's that school in the park blocks up there. Have you read USA Today, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Business Journal, or the Oregonian? They all have the same message. They are coming. They are coming. Who's coming? People and more people. Geographers, demographers, economists, planners, futurists, all warn us that the Pacific Northwest, and more specifically, the Portland metropolitan area, is going to grow much faster in population in the next decade than the rest of the country. Some predict we will have 300,000 more people here in the next 10 years. I've seen other predictions we will have 300,000 people in the next 18 to 20 years. Sounds frightening, but have you driven over to Gresham lately, or out Sunset Highway to 185th, or down 99 through Tiger? Go across the bridge to Battleground or Hazeldale. Ladies and gentlemen, the people are coming. They are coming down from Seattle. They're moving up from the Bay Area, from Los Angeles, from the East Coast. Make no mistake about it, our Camelot on the Columbia is going to grow. And as it does, we must take a hard look at our infrastructure. New residents will require more highways, more mass transportation, more public service, utilities, police protection, cultural offerings, social services, and of course, education. If we're going to have a major metropolitan area with this growth in inhabitants, we must be prepared with a major institution of higher education here to serve those educational needs of those new residents. And this city, this community, and its citizens must necessarily look to Portland State University to fulfill the educational demands in a broad variety of disciplines. There are a number of solutions to this problem. One approach is joint programs and joint degrees in cooperation with private universities and other public institutions. Our provost, Dr. Frank Martino, who's sitting here today, came to us from the City University of the New York system. He is a strong advocate of this idea. He has seen it work. We must develop closer relationships with the University of Oregon and Oregon State University. But without consolidation and without control from one institution over another. We must respond to the needs of our urban villages, such as Beaverton and Gresham, by establishing satellites and branch campuses in those areas. We must give our residents the opportunity to study for careers and disciplines not offered on our campus. To do this, faculties from our sister institutions must teach in our classrooms. We must also increase access for minorities and disadvantaged students. Finally, we must be adequately funded so that we are not constrained by enrollment ceilings that limit our ability to serve all of our residents. PSU is a young institution. Our unique strengths include innovative interdisciplinary programs in our School of Urban and Public Affairs, our Graduate School of Social Work, and our System Science programs. The Portland metropolitan area is our living, learning, laboratory to study and solve urban and social problems, family and child needs, and many others. As an urban institution, we are tailored to serve the needs of this metropolitan area. We are not like the traditional universities that were founded prior to World War II, and we should not be compared with them. We are an emerging public institution which must meet urban needs much as the land-grant colleges met agrarian needs over 100 years ago. We are establishing our own footprint in funding, in tuition, in faculty salaries. We should not be placed on a second tier 
below our sister institutions in the Willamette Valley. We are a major player in the future development of this metropolitan area and state. An immediate priority for us is to support the governor and our chancellor in their efforts to increase faculty salaries. This is a prerequisite to attract and retain quality faculty that we must have in our institutions. We can no longer use as a magnet our camping, hiking, fishing, clean air, pure water, pristine environment to offset the financial incentives offered elsewhere. In the next biennium, there will be legislation proposed to identify $50 million to attract and retain faculty. I know that the American Electronics Association supports this measure, and I applaud those efforts. I am hopeful that this will also receive your endorsement. Finally, I urge all of you to follow the efforts of the Governor's Commission on Higher Education and help us make a convincing case for a strong and healthy major urban university in this area. To summarize, Portland State is an urban institution that is destined to play a major role in the future growth and development of this great city. A significant effort must be made to increase cooperation between all institutions of higher education in the metropolitan area as well as all other state institutions. If any reorganization of higher education structures in the state of Oregon is necessary to respond to this metropolitan area, let it be a stronger partnership between Portland State University and the Oregon Health Sciences University. In conclusion, I would again commend the AEA membership for articulating their educational needs. But if we are going to be successful and compete with other states and other nations, we must find ways to respond not only to the electronics industry, but to the educational needs of all of the community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. Since we all ran a little long, I'm going to use the uh, limited power that is given to the president of the City Club to ask both of our speakers to give very brief closing remarks, and then we will move directly to questions from the floor, beginning with Jim Robertson. Uh, with that, a brief remark from Scott Gibson. Okay, I, I think you're getting the picture that really we have more in common than we have at, in, at issue. Uh, we, we agree that most of the AEA report was uh, very much articulating the needs for our industry and for a broad educational base in Portland. And where we disagree is that there are multiple ways to align a university system. Each has pros and cons, um, but the choice is simple. We can devise a system that essentially uh, uh, mandates investments at PSU over those at University of Oregon or OSU and we don't think that particular approach is politically possible. It would actually be our preferred approach if we thought it politically possible, but we don't. Our other option is to fashion a system that provides the financial incentive for our downstate universities to assume the mission to serve what would be the largest market that they would serve, the Portland market. We chose this latter approach because we think that finding a way to make University of Oregon and Oregon State at home in Portland is a way to break down a lot of the barriers that are dividing regions of the states, constituencies, uh, basically the us versus them part. There are risks in this approach, and we certainly acknowledge those, but there are also benefits. Students who graduate from the Portland campus uh, would now have the name brands of University of Oregon and Oregon State without ever having to leave Portland. Faculty here would also be associated with the state name brand universities. Perhaps even more important though, all of Portland would have a stake in the vitality of University of Oregon and Oregon State, not just Eugene and Corvallis. That holds the promise of a kind of broad support necessary to elevate both these universities to a level that produces invaluable benefits to our state and reaches a critical mass in our small state. Our bottom line is to obtain the university resources Portland desperately needs. 
And whether you like it or not, Oregon State's system of higher education is politically driven because it is resources, not markets, that power our universities. You can disdain how the system works, but you cannot ignore it. What we have in Portland is a university that, try as it might, always will finish third in battles over funding with its two more powerful, more entrenched sister universities. We can fight it, or we can find a way around it. AEA Oregon merely proposed a way around it. If there's a better way, we're all ears and very receptive to hearing about it. Thank you. Roger. Well, I'm a little concerned about those name brands because every now and then I find that there's something in those name brands aren't quite as important. But let me speak briefly to the facts of life in the next decade and in the 21st century. They're going to require us to educate students to be world-wise and knowledgeable in many areas. Students, they must know at least one foreign language. They must have a sensitivity to different cultures. They must solve the problems of pollution and hazardous waste. They must help us maintain our competitiveness in international business and banking. They must develop new approaches for solving our social needs. They must acquire an appreciation for the fine and performing arts, and they must have skills in sciences and medicine. One need only look at the graduates emerging from the institutions in Japan or West Germany to realize we have a global contest to develop quality graduates in this nation. This is the challenge that faces all institutions of higher learning today. The faculty and the administration at Portland State, your major urban institution, are poised to respond. And I dare say that when an employer looks to hire an employee from the state of Oregon, he looks at the quality of that graduate more than he does where that graduate attended school. Thank you. Just one comment for both Roger and I. I think it really demonstrates the maturity of our state that we can be having this discussion today and a real promise for tomorrow that we can be having the discussion and that these issues are on the table. So we're both very happy to be here and, uh, and have this discussion with all of you. I am also going to be very happy when I negotiate the acquisition of sequent computer from Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew that was coming. <laughs> Well, to continue this love feast, we're now in the question and answer portion of our program. I will remind everyone that if you do have a written question, please hold it up so the staff can bring it forward. The microphone is in the center of the room where Jim Robertson, the chair of the Higher Education Subcommittee of the Education Standing Committee, uh, is now standing. I'd also like to thank Jim's committee, Carla Kelly, Mark Abrams, John Canelon, Karen McKinney, Stan Myers, Cassie Smith, Gene Sobel, Nancy Tang, and Becky Wolcott, who worked very hard to bring this program together. And with that, Jim, would you please address your first question? I'm going to also exercise a prerogative and not ask the very long, involved question that I gave each of you in writing to ask a, a shorter <laughs> one, <laughs> much less controversial. The search for a new president at Portland State University is well underway. What kind of a leader would you recommend the university hire? An academic leader, a political strategist, a fundraiser, a community leader? Search committees tend to say all of the above. But where would each one of you place your emphasis in the talents of the next president for Portland State University? Well, I think that probably we need an accommodation. We need to look to urban institutions not dissimilar to, to Portland State. We need to look to major urban institutions throughout the United States and look at provosts and deans in those areas that have had the exposure to success. And I believe that we will find someone of that caliber. I guess I would say it should be somebody who can articulate a clear vision to responding to the, the obvious needs that exist within our community, both the metropolitan needs, the needs from other industries, and the needs from the high tech industry, and articulate that vision in a clear enough fashion that the students, the professors, and uh, the people we'd recruit to this state could help fulfill that mission. 
So someone very motivational and persuasive with, with vision that has substance, not just words. Yes, sir. Don Wilner, member of the City Club, question for Mr. Gibson. As I listen carefully to what you've been saying, I think I hear you saying that a major comprehensive university for Portland uh, is not politically possible. Therefore, we should look at other alternatives. And implicit in that may be your recognition that the branch campus approach for the major metropolitan area hasn't worked anywhere in the United States. My question is this. In 1969, I was the author of the law changing Portland State College into Portland State University. It worked because we had the political muscle, which included every major university in the Portland met metropolitan area on one team. Since then, possibly the electronics industry has looked elsewhere. Why don't you get back on the team so we have one unified approach for the Portland metropolitan area and win now as we did in 1969? The funny thing about people with controversy opinion, sometimes they have arrows in their back. We're trying to recommend what we believe to obviously be controversial and that we're, we're criticizing to some degree what, what exists and complementing the pockets of quality we see. Um, we do hire, all of our companies hire numerous Oregon graduates and we all of our companies have close relationships with U of O, Oregon State, uh, PSU, University of Portland, Oregon Institute of Technology, uh, and I could enumerate numerous cooperations, fundings, uh, people giving their time to all those universities. I think the, the reality is we are not a state of 10 to 15 million people. We're a state of 2.5, 2.6 million people. And it's our fundamental belief that a state this size cannot afford three major research universities all attempting to create excellence in a broad category of, of specialities, and, and that's what we think is a fundamental hypothesis that's wrong and needs to be changed if we're to make substantive change. Yes, Jim Chief. Westwood, City Club member. Uh, Mr. President, before I begin my question, I'd like to uh, ask unanimous consent for, say, a 10-minute extension of our time today. It looks like we have some good questions and may go over our time limit. Boy, you know, Jim, as somebody who has served many times here as parliamentarian, you ought to know that I can't take motions <laughs> like that from the floor. I, I was going to do that by fiat and make everybody like me. But, uh, <laughs> go ahead. I have a question for Mr. Gibson. Assuming that the Governor's Commission does not adopt the recommendation of the AEA that Portland State be dismantled and instead moves toward consolidation of institutions in the metropolitan area, with Portland State as the leader and with a uh, sufficient funding and high tech in Washington County uh, being taken into account. Assuming this happens, mm -hmm. will the AEA fall behind such a recommendation and move for its adoption? Uh, good question. I appreciate that question. First of all, the word dismantled always little hairs on the back of my neck go up because that's not what we're proposing. Um, as far as will we support another recommendation that would put a large amount of money behind growing a Portland uh, metropolitan and Washington County support in science and engineering, certainly we'd fall behind something like that. We're not proposing that our approach is unique. We, we, we believe it's the most viable approach, but if we're proven wrong that politically there can be support to make Portland State the most major university with uh, more than $100 million of extra funding to, uh, to, to bring it to excellence in science and engineering, uh, I think you'd find our members behind, uh, behind that solution. We don't think that's what's going to be the result, uh, but we would fall behind something, of course, that made that kind of progress in the state. Let's face it, that would be a big step. If all that our report does is catalyze discussion and institute that kind of change, we'll all be smiling. John Wish, City Club member. A question to both of you. Have you considered vouchers as an alternative to present funding in order to break the political logjam in resource allocation? Could you explain what yeah. you mean by ne vouchers? Neither of us, we looked at that each other, neither of us know what vouchers okay. are. Uh, that some of the state subsidies or state 
government funds would be given directly to Oregon citizens to buy their education wherever they thought they could get it best. It's an idea that's, that I've heard raised on high schools before. I'll have to answer that I don't think I can give an intelligent answer to the question. I've never heard the concept. That's, that's a tough one. I think there is, there's potential in something like that at maybe K through 12. I'm not so sure that if you look at the amount of investment that currently has been made in the eight institutions of higher education in Oregon and then tell the taxpayer, here's a voucher, you can go ahead and send your child to the University of Washington if he can get in, if that's what the intention is here. I think we would uh, slowly become the 51st state in this great nation. I don't know. It doesn't excite me. I'm sorry. It's, it's now our normal adjourned time of 1.15, and I will take Jim Westwood's suggestion with the, the speaker's willingness to stick on for another 10 or 15 minutes, but we will adjourn promptly at 1.30. For those of you that do leave, please try and do so quietly. Yes, sir. David Wu, every time I hear this debate about the future role of Portland State or reorganizing Portland State, I think of people in a sinking lifeboat having a squirt gun fight or something. <laughs> it seems that the terms of the debate are all wrong. And I was wondering how each of you gentlemen would feel about putting off the discussion and putting off the uh, debate and as an initial step, perhaps moving the State Board of Higher Education and the entire administrative apparatus of the system from wherever it is now <laughs> uh, to either Portland or uh, neutral territory in Salem. And then if the debate is still necessary in 10 years, reconvening the discussion at that point. <laughs> Uh, a well-worded well -worded question. Uh, <laughs> I think it makes sense when I look at a company and how a company addresses its market. A company has to be absolutely close to its customers. There are more customers for the educational product in Portland than anywhere else in the state. AEA would salute any kind of movement of the people who run the state system of higher education. To, to be closer to the major amount of customers that exist, which would mean a movement to the Portland area. And certainly that could start by uh, the movement of, of Tom Bartlett to Portland uh, to try and give some balance to the downstate side. Uh, I would support that. Our, our industry would support that. Uh, Mr. Wu, I'm not going to hold my breath until that happens. But he would take the 10 years off in the debate. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> Dundalk Okagla, City Club member. A question to Mr. Gibson. Uh, the, when uh, issues like this are being discussed, it's always uh, uh, valuable to look at the national picture. And there have been many other states which have also looked at the possibility of having branch campuses. For example, Purdue has a branch campus in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. University of Missouri Rolla has a branch campus in uh, St. Louis. Penn State has a branch campus in Harrisburg, and many others. Uh, and the objective is the same thing, to bring the research-based higher education to those areas. But interestingly, if uh, the research expenditures of those areas are looked at, uh, it's uh, invariably found that uh, they vary somewhere between 0 and 8 percent. 0 and 8 percent of the total engineering research being done by those universities. Therefore, between 92 percent and 100 percent is being done on the land grant campus or wherever that establishment is. As a result, in fact, Florida has taken the exactly opposite approach and developed the University of Central Florida, University of South Florida, which have become the centers of excellence. Now, if the AA recommendation is adopted and five or six years down the road, if we realize that we have created a glorified community college in Portland, what at that time will be AA's recommendation? <laughs> That seems like a did I beat my wife lately type of question. Uh, no kidding. And the answer is no. So uh, uh, I, I guess to say we, we did look at some of the systems that you mentioned, sir, uh, in, in producing our report, specifically the Indiana uh, and the, the medical campus that's been formed in Indianapolis 
as a result of a need to move more educational and continuing ed need in the metropolitan area of Indianapolis. And we've seen successful examples of what we uh, recommend and we've seen unsuccessful uh, examples of what we recommend. And like, like anything, how a company is structured, where it puts its divisions, who it puts in charge, who it puts in charge of its divisions, you can find successful examples of structure or unsuccessful examples of structure. I submit to you it's more a function of the leadership that we employ than the structure itself, although structure can't be ignored. I'm, for one, am pleased to, to give some of that uh, mission to, to, and, and to wait to see uh, the good things I think we can expect from Tom Bartlett uh, in his position. And so with that uh, initial step, I think we're, we've got more in favor of uh, movement than we have in favor of chaos. Any comment on that? Yes, ma'am. Diana Smiley, City Club member. My question is for Scott Gibson also. Given the fact that Oregon State University and the University of Oregon uh, feel themselves to be, and in reality are, very strapped for funds and are extremely, it's extremely difficult for them to maintain their programs at quality levels, I'm wondering, even with another $100 million in, in funds, supposedly for the Portland area, how we're going to motivate those leaders, those administrations and faculties to actually place those new funds, whatever they may be, in the Portland area. Um, you know, what's the dynamic there? What are the politics of, mm -hmm. of actually influencing them to do that once they have control? That's an excellent question. And we're something we're embroiled in right now, since we're not in a legislative session, this is a great time to start lobbying and influencing the right people. Uh, I do want to say that our our recommendation is predicated on a substantial amount of money being infused in the system. If we were to find that there was not the commitment to, to infuse quite a bit of money into the Portland area to be used in the Portland area, I dare say we recognize that our recommendation then is not optimum uh, should there not be the additional monies available. So part of our major focus now as a, as a group, and remember we do this part time, we've got businesses that have one and a half year product cycles uh, and customers who call uh, uh, to take care of. But in our part-time part responsibilities, we try and, and lobby the uh, influential people who control our budgets to try and free up some more money, especially in light of the surplus situation we're in at the state. It's, to me, almost criminal with that money there that we're not investing it uh, we're just drawing interest on it. We're not investing it in a, in a high return on investment uh, thing like education. I, I would just like to comment on that as well. We speak to this hundred million dollars or other offhand and so forth. I'm really wondering how much of that is expected to come from the state and how much from uh, private industry in as much as, as I recall in the AEA report, uh, industry in Oregon was next to last after Hawaii in contributing to higher education. So I assume that hundred million is, we're talking about state money? Yeah, that was contributing to education in Oregon. We were uh, four percent versus a national average, I think, of about seven percent. Uh, and that, that's in, you know, that's a chicken and egg. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that because the education systems are a problem or is it because we're the problem? It's some of both. Uh, it's a, definitely a chicken and egg issue. Yeah. 